I wanted to put out a how to play Phasmophobia video. I know there's a lot of new folks coming and some returning folks coming back to the game. So I wanted to put something out. I want to be comprehensive and we'll dig right into the guide. This is where you load in. When you come up to the board, you want to left click and that essentially brings you to the game menu. First thing we're going to go over are the basic options of the game when you start. You click options. You've got a lot of the general controls and settings you would expect in a game. Phasmophobia's menu selection is not overly complicated, but if you the first time you played or some of the early times you played, if you want to mess around with these settings, it's a good thing to do. Your audio settings. Real important here, make sure you have your correct mic set up and your correct mic selected. Voice is important in this game because you will use voice talk, not only to talk to your fellow hunters, but also the ghost itself. The other thing is push to talk, your voice input. I typically set mine to push to talk and you can map that button. There's a reason behind that, but a lot of people don't set that up. A lot of people have an open mic and that's fine. There is no right or wrong, but there are pros and cons to both of that. So again, that's an item where you can kind of play with and see what works best for you. Your controls, that's just your control mapping. Map it how you like. It's very user friendly and there's just not a lot of controls to worry about. Graphics. This will obviously determine how your game might run based on your hardware. Feel free to tweak stuff if you want a little better performance. Other. So these are the menu options. You will be using things like thermometers. Your language obviously is one. Your voice recognition, it's determining and reading, trying to read your native language you're speaking. And that is a very important piece. All right, so that's the basic options menu. Certainly visit this the first time you come in. Let's move on to game types. So at this time, Phasmophobia is going to put out an update to how you create lobbies, and they can all be done from a single menu. It'll be a great update. You can see here a graphic of some of the key components. This isn't final, but it should be near final. So I'm going to explain the existing menus next, but just know this will be the new interface. And by game types, I mean number of players and how you set those games up. All right, so you'll see up here, we have a couple of game type modes, single player and multiplayer. Single player, very easy, also known as solo. As you guessed it, is just you playing the game. Pro, you're in complete control. You can pick whatever you want. You can leave whenever you want. Whatever you want to do, it's in your control, as I said. The downside is there's only one person hunting. Only one person bringing equipment in. So, you know, certainly the risk all falls on you. Pick what you like. And at the same time, when you're starting doing a solo run or two, or even just a few to get comfortable, makes a lot of sense. It builds your confidence. You don't feel the pressure of other people and you may not know anybody. So that can be really awkward too. I wouldn't discourage you from trying multiplayer though. If you find some nice folks like I've done along the way from level one on, they're gonna help guide you and teach you as well. You just have to play around with it. But to build that initial confidence, feel free to come do a solo game. The next game option or the game type would be multiplayer. Multiplayer deals with the, with the idea of lobbies. Each of these lobbies or rooms as it's labeled here is representing a group of people that wanna play. In this case, it's gonna pull up the public lobbies. These are the ones that are readily available to click in and join. These will be randoms. You're rolling the dice. You may or may not know anybody. I will point out that the population over here shows you the number of players that are already in the lobby. So you can kind of look at that and see maybe if it's ready to roll. You've got a three out of four, just needs one player, great. And you have ones out of four where somebody just popped on or somebody left and there's a single person left in the lobby. Those might be dead. So be it, not a big deal, right? You can keep hitting this refresh button. This refresh button, although there's a little bit of a cooldown here, will restack the names. It will clear off the lobbies that have gotten full and loaded and it will add in the lobbies that are new and are still waiting for players so you can see here we've got seven pages of lobbies a decent amount of lobbies that's kind of how you can look for the public lobby select one i'm just going to go in here so you can just kind of see what you see when you load in so we're going to pick this small lobby so this guy has created a lobby doesn't have a contract or anything one thing when you enter a lobby you can see randoms they have volume controls so you can change volume huh? players in the lobbies. That's really nice and helpful. I got kicked out of that lobby because I wasn't talking. Perfectly fine. I didn't want to stay in there anyway. So if you kicked out of a lobby or sometimes you do error out, that's fine. You'll come back, you hit resume, and boom, you're back to your multiplayer, single player selection. All right, we're going to go back into multiplayer. And other multiplayer things, create private. Create private is you setting up a lobby similar to those that are listed, 
but nobody else can enter it unless you let them, unless you give them a code. So this is made for pre-mades where you would have a friend or other folks you want to play with up to four that you want to get into this game and not allow any others to play in. A uh, key point here is I'm the leader. I've got the crown, so I control the lobby. And if I want to let people in, then you can come over here and there's this invite code. An invite code listed here is random numbers based on you entering the lobby. It'll be different each time. So as long as you maintain this lobby, this code stays the same. The lobby closes if everybody leaves. This code is no longer valid. You'll have to create a new private multiplayer game. You give somebody this code and then they would be able to join your session and you would be able to play with them as long as you want until they leave or until you kick them multiple games as long as you want to do that. Totally, totally fine. So that's the way you would set up a pre-made group um, in Phasmophobia. Very nice, very helpful when you find some cool people to play with. As we said before, the create private gives you a code. If you come down here, if somebody had created a private game and you wanted to join it, you would click join private game. Join private game, as you see here, is asking you for a code. So whatever that code was, that lobby, you would then enter this code here. When you enter that and click enter, it'll insert you into their lobby and you're ready to go. You guys can talk to each other. You'd play the game together. You are joining that pre-made group. Very cool thing. But depending on what you want to do, how you want to set it up, here's your options. Next up, we're going to work with the maps and the difficulty setting. The maps range in size from a, a basically a single story house with a small basement all the way up to a large insane asylum, a large high school. There, there's some really big maps out there. One of the first houses you're going to come across if you play a tutorial or if you start out basic it's going to be Tanglewood Street House. We're going to pick that. Tanglewood Street House is most basic map. It has 11 rooms in total. It includes a second story, which is essentially a one room basement. It's a very small second room. So I consider it basically a one story uh, for purposes, but technically there's two. There is a stairwell and there is a basement to consider. And it is relevant because there is an item in that basement. Next thing you'll notice is the amateur here. This is the difficulty setting. Your settings range from amateur and immediate professional to nightmare. There is a difficulty setting set to custom coming. This is June, 2022. And that custom difficulty is in the works, hopefully in the next month, they will be putting that out and they have some details more to come. But in the end, as you can guess, that difficulty setting will let you play around with some of the nuances uh, from the other difficulties. The difficulty determines a number of things. You'll see here at amateur, which is your, your lowest difficulty, it's going to give you a long time to set up. What that means is you're going to have plenty of time to bring your equipment into the house, put it where it needs to be, and get ready to try to find the ghost and figure out what the ghost is. It's a very lenient uh, thing, and I'll show you how that shows up when you get when you take the next step. Long hunt grace period. That means the ghost is not going to get angry at you essentially for a long time. Again, very liberal, very open, flexible time frame for you. Low stress short hunt duration if and when the ghost does hunt you it's not going to be very long you're going to be at a hide and it's going to blow through the house pretty quick and then it'll stop hunting and give you more time to set up and keep looking for it so that's a positive sanity pills we'll go over those but they restore a lot of sanity sanity is a, a means to not necessarily a health bar but it's it's a measure of the aggressiveness of the ghost relative to hunting so in that sense, you can think of it sort of as a hunt health bar, if you will. But we'll talk about that. Sanity pills are a way to mitigate the loss of sanity. And then you regain lost equipment, half your lost equipment when you die. So if you happen to die on a hunt, certainly in a solo, if you're the one that, if you die, then, the, then that particular hunts fail, you lose your equipment. That is the downside of adding equipment and phasmophobia. Keep in mind, a key piece here is you only lose what you've added. And you, you don't get penalized for the starter items you bring. And we'll talk about that. This sounds really bad, but it's not necessarily a really scary thing. But this would be the issue of losing money. You, you're paying money to buy equipment. So if you lose equipment, you have to go and buy it again. And therefore, it costs you money. That's the idea behind that. Just a few key points. That's amateur. We're going to move up intermediate. You're going to see a few of these things change. One of the things that's added here at intermediate and beyond is the fuse box starts off. The fuse box is an item in a map that turns map power on. There's a reason for that that's important. We'll talk about that as well. 
but just know that's an item to consider as you move up to intermediate professional and nightmare they all have that fuse box off you'll notice here's hunt times and setup times begin to drop to the point where there is no hunt time set up it's zero and so as soon as you go in you're at risk of sanity loss and hunting so again these kind of things change the positive from that as you move up in difficulty is the rewards are higher so greater risk greater reward and that is the case difficulty settings here important to note so pick the one you're comfortable with i would tell you don't be afraid to go up in difficulty don't let that intimidate you you can always bring the basic equipment it doesn't cost you anything so if you die you don't really lose anything and it just maybe builds your confidence so don't be afraid to push that i wouldn't start out at nightmare if you're just starting the game it's going to make it really challenging you might get discouraged but certainly you could begin at intermediate after a few games on amateur and professional is frankly not that much harder to be honest with you so don't be afraid of that all right we're going to select professional for for my sake here all right now we're going to move on to the equipment list what you have here is what we would call the starter items or starter equipment these items will be a little foreign to you if you're just starting but just know these are some basic things you need and can use on the hunt to try to find the ghost identify it and accomplish some objectives along the way these items are free i didn't buy these or add these these are there no matter what so if you're out of money or brand new starting you will have these items in your list i could go start the hunt right now and just use this equipment not a big deal right so that is the starter equipment the other thing you can do is now add equipment or buy equipment add equipment is organized by main equipment and optional equipment main equipment are things that you'll see mimic the starter equipment they are items they consider important or must-haves and i would argue that the bulk of that is true you will want to bring at least one of each of these things flashlight is questionable but anyway those are the main equipment items if it's just you hunting if you're playing solo you don't necessarily need to bring multiples of everything you may only need one emf reader or you may only need one spirit box you're the only one that's going to be using some of this stuff so to go in here and just hit all on everything might risk equipment loss that you don't need to take on if you were to die instead of doing that you might just kind of think through this you'll have to learn the equipment and again it's okay to hit all for simplicity when you start but at the end of the day as you learn more about the equipment and what you use you'll be able to discern when you need multiples or not and, and when you play multiplayer your chances of needing multiple items or actually using the multiple items is more relevant don't be afraid to bring equipment but at the same time you don't need to waste money or, or risk losing it when you know you won't need it much like the main equipment you have optional equipment these are items that you don't need but i would consider many of them important if you want to truly hunt the ghost and you want to accomplish objectives and you want to make money which is a big part of the game certain things you will only need one certain things you'll actually need zero if you're playing solo for instance this head mounted camera nobody can see your camera you can't see your own so nobody's going to be able to see what you can see and so there's no reason to bring any of those you might as well not bring any and not risk losing them if you die there's big game there to consider that you don't need to waste your money so there's the optional equipment if you wanted to fully load your loadout to go on a hunt they've added an all button when you come back out here you'll see all that equipment we selected listed and you'll see that we've selected two out of two we've selected the max amounts out of these again i'm fully loaded i've put everything that i possibly can bring it for the hunt and it's all ready to go if you happen to be missing something you can come to this buy menu now they're getting ready to update the equipment menu the inventory menu and they're going to make it more graphically driven you're going to be able to see the items it's going to be a little easier to buy stuff and look at total cost it's really going to be a good update but the same concept will apply you'll be adding it for the hunt you'll be purchasing it if you don't have it same thing this should be pretty straightforward to you you'll notice the exact same equipment listed as you would if you were adding so it's all the same equipment list no different in this case you're truly buying it from the store so if i had no dots projectors i would come in here and buy a dots projector it would be added to my inventory and then i can in turn add it to my list of equipment to bring to the hunt so that's the equipment list the quote-unquote store and how to load yourself up for the hunt what i've done now is I've picked my starter equipment. I've selected my map. I selected my difficulty. The next thing to do when you're ready to go into the hunt is to ready up. If you're in a multiplayer, everybody will have to ready up. 
And once everybody reads ready, you can hit the start button and you're headed off. I will add one more thing uh, that we left. Anybody in the party can add equipment. Anybody in the party can add a different amount of equipment. There's still a max amount of equipment to bring. You know, there's only so much you can bring of each. The nuance there is whoever adds the equipment, they're at risk for loss. So if I added all the equipment and I were to die, I would lose my equipment. If I were to create a game and somebody added the equipment for me into the list and I died, I wouldn't lose any equipment. So it's really the risk of loss falls to the person that adds the equipment into the game. That's the way it's set up now. So we've loaded into the truck. You'll notice there's a lot of stuff here. What we'll do first is we'll come over here. This is a key. There will always be a key on a map. This allows you into the front door or any outside door of the building you're going to enter. You hit E to pick that up. Always do that. It's funny, even now, oftentimes everybody would be running around, getting equipment, looking around, and we'll forget the key. It's pretty funny. When you go to the front door, if you don't have it, the door won't open. You got to go back and get the key. Pretty funny. But usually somebody grabs that early on. It'll be, always be here on the desk. You can tell if somebody did, and if somebody did not, pick it up. You're good to go. Optional objectives. So the optional objective board is just that. It's the objectives of your hunt. This is going to guide you through what you should accomplish, and it's a little different each time, so we'll go through those. Objective one is always going to be to discover the ghost. That is going to stay the same no matter what. Now, your ghost will be different, of course, each time, but that objective is not randomized, does not change. Objectives two through four are randomized uh, for each hunt. Some of them are driven to very simple things that you can accomplish basically as soon as you walk in. Other ones are very complicated or more complex that involve letting the ghost chase you and not dying. They range in varying difficulties, varying challenges, and you don't have to complete them all. You, you don't have to complete any objectives, frankly, but each one of these is gonna give you money. At this point, it's $10 a piece when you leave and, and you get your award. So it's worth doing those, certainly worth accomplishing those easy ones as you go through. Some folks like to be co completionist. I don't see why you wouldn't, assuming you're not at risk of dying. To try to knock those off, you ultimately wanna make money. That's your objectives. If you notice the paragraph below that, You've got the ghost's name. There is a relevant reason for that. It tells you the ghost may like groups, may respond better. You can use that name to anger it and create paranormal activity. And then make sure you check your journal. We'll mention the journal briefly. So the ghost name is relevant and the ghost name, if you use it, typically angers the ghost more and more. So if you want your ghost to be more active or if you wanted him to start hunting you, which there's reasons for that, you can use that name and get them fired up and angry at you. The ghost responds alone or in groups. When you're talking to the ghost or you're trying to trigger certain things, sometimes you do want to be in the room or wherever it is by yourself. It'll respond. And other times you want multiplayers in there to get it to respond. So if you're not getting responses to certain things or things don't seem to be very active, one option is to have folks leave the area and try the same type of response interactions to see if you get any info that way. So that's your optional objectives board. If you hit the J button, this is your journal. This is sort of your overall reference manual for the hunt. It's very good. It used to be very basic and now they've really made it robust. You've got a lot of choices here. You've got your tabs at the top, it tells you it's a little bit of a guide as to what certain things are. Evidence kind of walks you through. The overview is a, a very similar step. You're dealing with this whiteboard. It's, it's gonna mimic that. You're gonna see these optional objectives, it says grab your key, tells you the ghost name. We don't know what it responds to. So it's got a lot of that same info. So you don't have to keep coming back to the truck and look at that. You used to have to do that. But now that's all in your nifty journal when you press J. Photos, one thing you'll see is we have a photo camera and we're gonna take some pictures. Each of those pictures can be worth money. So something to, to look at. And this gives you reference to what pictures have been taken. So you can keep track of that. There are a limited number of pictures, so keep that in mind as well. Evidence. This is your primary tab for objective one, discovering the ghost. This is where you're going to do all your dirty work, if you will, finding the evidence, identifying items, and ultimately leading to the ghost you think it is. It's a process of elimination is what you're dealing with. This is the goal of objective one. This is figuring out what the ghost type is. These ghosts all have different clues, different stats, different strengths, weaknesses, different evidence types. You'll see here, you can flip through, you can click the individual ones, 
brings you to the page. It's really, really nice. So spend some time in your journal learning. And even during hunts now at level 1900 or whatever, I still go through. They'll add ghosts. And even the old ghosts might, might change a little bit. So it's important to go through and read that and just learn more about it. Your journal is a great guide. As these are the different types of evidences. These can be found and discovered by using certain equipment, which we'll talk about, as I said. So just know this is your reference. When you want to use a particular or want to evidence a particular item and register that, you can click it once. It will mark it as with an X, which means you have that evidence. You've discovered that evidence. If you want to eliminate that evidence from, from an option, you would click it again. It puts a line through. If you know, for instance, you're not freezing in there and you wanted to click that out and eliminate some of the ghost options, you would double click and it eliminates it. If you happen to click it, you can click it again and it resets. So it's very user friendly. This will be an important page. When you leave the hunt, you will ultimately want to have some ghost selected. This will determine whether you complete objective one or not. Very important detail. All right, so that's your J, your journal menu. There's a little look at that, a little more information. Moving along, Tanglewood Street House. So this was the map we selected. This is gonna be a, a overview layout of the actual map itself. In this case, you've got arrows that show you the floors, first floor, second floor. The green entry point, which will be the front doors located right there. You can see that. And then you have this power switch, in this case, a breaker, as they call it. This toggles the power of the house on and off. And so this is relevant. This will allow you to turn on lights and use things like that. It will also increase the temperature of the house, which is relevant. It will help you find the ghost. And so it is important to maintain that. There are ghosts that actually like the power on, and there's ghosts that like it off. Again, learn your ghost. I'm not going to go into any more detail there, but that green spot is identified as your power source. In this case, it's on the front on the first floor, and that happens to be the garage. I just know that because I know the map. If I want to go in and hit that breaker on, I will make my way to the garage, and you simply push the button on the breaker. It's a red box. It will turn green, and your power is on. Next, Team Sanity. Team Sanity, and you'll notice is average as well, is essentially a ghost hunt life bar. You'll have a sanity box for each player. In this case, it's just me, but if I had three other players, you would have a similar box with a different colored line, one representing each player. So that would appear. And then our sanities might change in different levels. So the average represents the average of the number of players' sanities together. Some ghosts hunt when your average sanity is pretty high and then continue to hunt you as it drops. Other ghosts will not hunt you until you hit a different sanity level, for instance, a 50% or 40%. It depends on the ghost type and those details, but just know your average sanity helps you navigate the timer, if you will, of the potential risk of ghost hunt. There's a lot of factors in determining what affects your sanity, and we'll touch base on that a little bit, but just know this is where you monitor your sanity. As well, whatever color bar you have here will also determine your dot on the map. Other players that are in the truck during the hunt will be able to see where you are on the map and your dot color can be followed and guided. It's particularly helpful on large maps. Somebody may get lost or may be close to the place and can't quite find it. Somebody in the truck will be able to guide them and get them to the right spot. So it's another cool feature they did. So the bar color is relevant and you'll see dots. In this case, I can't see myself because I'm not in the house, but just know if I go in, there will be a red dot in here and you could see me. Sound sensors, there's a particular item over here. It looks like a microphone and we'll show you that. Where if you place that in the house at different locations, it will pick up paranormal sounds. And then you have this total activity. This is representing the ghost activity in, in the building. So the more active the ghost is, the more you're gonna hear from it, the more you're gonna notice if you're angering it. And ultimately you're gonna see it potentially hunt those that are in the building. Activity level ranges your strength from zero to 10, and the higher your activity, the more aggressive and, and angry the ghost is at you. And this will vary over time. So you may have a zero, you may go up to five, you may go to eight, you come back down. It can be whatever. If the ghost is hunting somebody in the house, it will register to a 10, and it will remain a 10 over the cycle. You can kind of follow the hunt. As soon as the hunt's over, that activity will drop, and so you can tell that the ghost is done hunting, and you can re-enter the building, and resume your, your evidence gathering. Computer. Computer is actually relevant besides being able to click the keyboard and type. People love doing that. If you click the keyboard, it toggles a night vision and then a regular vision. So that's relevant. <clears throat> In this case, there's a pre-built camera. 
at the front door of this particular map, not overly helpful, but in larger maps, there's cameras throughout already built in. So you can cycle those. How you cycle cameras is with the mouse. You would simply come over here and click your left button on the mouse and it will toggle through the cameras you have set up. You can bring your own cameras and set them up in different spots. It will toggle through those. You also have head cameras here that players should pick up and wherever those players are, you can click through those active cameras as well by clicking the mouse. It may be easier to see night vision. It may be easier to see regular. Again, as you go to each camera, you can select either or. So that's the use of the computer. Very relevant once you get cameras going. The last thing I'll point out over here is this clock or this timer. If you remember when we talked about difficulty settings, there was a certain amount of lead up time before the ghost became active and you could prepare. This is that timer. This is, represents the amount of time you have to get set up before the active ghost hunting timer begin. I'm on professional, so there is no prep time. As soon as I enter that house, I begin to count down to when that ghost will get angry at me and hunt me. There's no prep time. Same thing with nightmare. Amateur and intermediate, there is some timer there, so it gives you a little more leeway, a little more of a buffer. But that's how you can track that. It will count down accordingly, and when it hits zero, you're at risk. The truck was recently overhauled. The equipment used to all be on shelves. Now it's on a wall. I like it. It's a little easier to see things. Here you have your wall of equipment. This corresponds to the inventory items we selected before we loaded in. Remember, we added whatever, we bought whatever, and put it in our list. This is what we brought. These are all the items. I'll go through what each item does in a, in a different section, but just know this is everything we selected and brought. We're going to grab some equipment. In this case, I'm going to grab a flashlight. If you pick up equipment, you want to use the E button. That's your standard E select for your picking up the equipment. You can carry up to three pieces of equipment in your hand and the head camera as well on top of your head. That does not count. I can get three other pieces of equipment. I've got a flashlight as one. In this case, I'm going to pick a thermometer. And then lastly, I will add a photo camera. That's all I can pick up. If I tried to pick up anything else, it will not let me. If I pick up something that I did not want by mistake, you can hit the G button. It will throw it down. If you dropped it by accident, you can come down and get the E button and pick it back up. You don't lose it. Just know that you can drop and pick up, not a big deal. The other item I'll show you, the last thing in the truck, is there's this keypad. This keypad is what you press. You come up to it and hit your left mouse. This will open and close the truck doors. To begin the hunt, you open the truck doors. And then you would approach the house and enter. To leave the hunt, you would press it again. If you press it again and the doors close, I believe you have five seconds. Once that timer runs out, you're going to leave the hunt. No matter what you've selected, what you've done, not done, that is it. You're closing the doors. You cannot leave without all the alive players in the truck. That's the one nuance. If you have dead players, you can leave without them. But all alive players must be in the truck before you can truly leave. So we're approaching the house. We're outside of it. There's that camera that's built in. I've gotten the key, so now I can enter. So we've opened the door, left click and push or pull depending on the door. And the next thing I'm gonna do is go find the breaker. You wanna listen for sounds as you walk through here, you'll get more familiar. Here's your breaker, we talked about lights. That is now on and I can turn lights on. If it were to off, no lights would work. Pretty obvious. There we go, breaker done. This is the garage. You'll learn the layout of the house. Here's the basement. Down here. Turn the light on. There's the little basement. Everything else is on the first floor. All right. Items when you get in a house. There are certain things you can do and grab early on, and they give you money. There are a number of things, actually. So one of the things on every map is the bone. A bone is some form of a human bone, go figure. In this case, a hand bone. And it's available for picture and pickup. Your photos provide you money, assuming they are taken at a certain quality and of particular items. The bone is one of those items. If you toggle your mouse wheel, you can select your different equipment. And in this case, I brought a camera. So I can right click with the camera selected. You notice it dropped me to four shots. And then I would pick that up. If I go to my journal, 
I now have a picture of a bone. Beautiful. Three stars, meaning it's the highest quality you can get. And this provides money at the end for the reward. Very important. That bone is available on all maps. It's easy money. You want to find that as you go through the house. In addition, there are cursed objects or cursed possessions in maps that does not always show up. I believe it's 70% of the time that you get cursed possessions. These items are unique items, and we can talk more about those in another video. This isn't the right time. But just know that there's things like these tarot cards, for instance, right here, that can be used that have different effects on ghosts in your hunt. There is a Ouija board, there's a voodoo doll, there is a music box. There are lots of things you can get that are cursed objects, cursed possessions. Then you can use those items for particular purposes, different things, or you don't have to. Just know there's consequences for using those items. So use them accordingly. Either way, you wanna get a photo of whatever it is. In this case, I got a picture of the tarot cards, another three star photo. All right, this is the car going off. That means the ghost is somewhere around this garage. When I entered the house, there is this little green bowl. It had a pair of keys in it. I picked them up. In order to turn that car off, if the ghost were to continue to hit it, you have to have that key picked up by some member of your party. When you do, you can come over here and left click the car and it turns that alarm off. You want to do that, especially if your car is where the ghost is. Very important. It'll drive you crazy otherwise. So I've gone through the house here. There's different things, different rooms to look at, all that fun. The next step is to figure out where the ghost is. I already have a little clue. He's setting off the car alarm. And so there's a very good chance my ghost is in the garage. But what I've done now is I've turned on the thermometer. The thermometer is one of the other tools I brought. So you can see here it's registered in Fahrenheit. You'll notice as I move about the house, that temperature changes, right? Right now I'm at 63.7, 62, but as I move closer to the ghost area, it is gonna get cooler in the thermometer. So now I'm down to 45. In this case, I'm getting colder, but I'm getting closer to the ghost area. I will move a little further since we heard the alarm go off on the car. It's a good chance he's right around here. So this tells me that this room is about 20 degrees colder than the rest of that house. It begins right here in the laundry room. So it's still a question of whether he's actually in the laundry room or the garage. Since we just saw a light flicker, I feel pretty confident he's going to be in the garage. All right, so we found the ghost room. To throw your equipment, like I said, you can hit G, it throws it down. You typically wanna throw your equipment close to the ghost room. I've still got my flashlight. So now I can pick up two more pieces of equipment and continue my hunt. Let's reference a few things. All right, so we found the breaker. My sanity, average sanity has not changed much. Lights on in the house, holding a candle. A few of those things keep your average sanity up and help slow the chance of the ghost hunting you. So that's a positive thing. The darkness, the number of cursed possessions you use or the amount of times you use a cursed possession and using certain equipment all those things calling the ghost name all those things can reduce your sanity of you and or any of the player on your team and your average sanity will begin to drop your sanity will begin to drop no matter what it'll just go at a slower rate so th that's kind of how the sanity affects it has not changed much for me i've dropped a 96 out of 100 and so the sanity is really still very high not a big risk of getting hunted. Now what I'm gonna do is pick up this and this. This is an EMF reader and this is a spirit box. We found the ghost area. You remember I told you about voice chat and then you're pushed to talk or memorizing your keys. This is where it's relevant. If you press your global chat button, in this case for me it's space, but it's different for you potentially, this will speak to everybody in your party, whether they're in the truck or in anywhere in the building, the global push to talk. The other voice setting is local. In this case, for me, it's marked as V by choice. Local push to talk allows you to speak to just what you would imagine, those in general proximity to you. This also affects the ghost. The ghost is gonna work off your local push to talk, typically. So if I wanted to talk to the ghost, I would hold down my local push to talk, or if I did not have it push to talk, it would just be the local, local voice chat. 
I'm going to use an item called a spirit box, and we're going to see if the ghost will talk to me. Where are you? How old are you? All right. So there we go. We've got a ghost to respond to our spirit box. That's a piece of evidence. If you notice when I turn this on, where are you? How old are you? There's an X that shows up. That means it's registering your voice. Not every ghost will use this item or respond to you. That's a ghost evidence. And if it does respond, you will hear it and you will see the little ghost figure on the far right of that spirit box light up or turn black. That means it's reading you, registering, and that it's talking to you. So there you go. This is an EMF reader. This EMF reader also registers ghost activity. It will help you identify where the ghost is and potentially lead you to a piece of evidence. I'm gonna turn this on and leave it in the room. You could walk around with it to get it to register, but just know that that's an item that it's good to have on. Let's look at our journal. We found one piece of evidence. We found spirit box. That was the thing we called out to the ghost and it responded. So we know that's a piece of our evidence. If we select that, it eliminates a lot of ghosts that do not respond to spirit box. So you don't have to remember all the nuances of each ghost, the different evidences, the book will kind of do it for you. But when you get down to it, you might ultimately have to make some decisions and calls. So it's not amazingly easy, but it certainly is very helpful. You don't have to memorize everything, but makes it user friendly. We did not have freezing temperatures. We went in there, we only had about 40. The house may take a minute more to kind of warm up and the room to cool off, but you typically have that relatively early. And even later on, you will be able to see your breath. Your breath will be cold. And so you'll know if you have that. At this point, I don't think we're gonna get that. So I'm gonna cross that off. I don't have to, and I can always undo it. But at this point, we're trying to eliminate what we don't have as evidence and what we do and ultimately arrive at the ghost type. So now we're going to bring a video camera. Video cameras can be brought either as handheld, like I have it here, or on a stand. The advantage of handheld is it you can carry it and rotate it through your equipment. If you bring a stand, as soon as you change your equipment and you're rotated, it drops. So there's a pro and a con. The stand's good because it lets you set it at a decent angle. Sometimes the handhelds are not, you're not able to drop those at good angles, but at the same time, you may not need to. So there's some pros and cons that way too. We're gonna bring that and we're also gonna bring what they call a dots projector. Now we're heading out. With your video camera, if you right click while you're holding it active out of the truck, you can see much like your computer, it has a night vision and a regular vision option. That's a right click. So you can toggle that. If your lights are on in the room, typically you do not wanna have night vision on because it can be very difficult to see. So there you go. Your dots. Your dots was a relatively new item added a few patches ago. Your dots helps you track ghost activity and as a piece of evidence. You will see it um, kind of a silhouette of a ghost run through there if it in fact is an, an item to of evidence to select. So there's your dots. Now, we will select that camera we put in there. You can see this corresponds to the one we dropped in the garage. Now, if you saw that, that was an example of dots. You saw that kind of silhouette walk through the camera image. So now we have dots. We would go to our journal and evidence and select a dots projector. That means that we triggered that piece of evidence. So now we're down to four choices of a ghost. We're getting there, very close. Okay, we've come this far. So now we can do a little process of elimination to see if any of the other evidence could even be relevant. It looks like most of that would be relevant and each one would lead to a different ghost. So we still need to figure out of these four items which is applicable. We're gonna bring a book and we're gonna bring a crucifix. The crucifix is a helpful item. The crucifix actually helps delay a ghost hunt. If you get it in the room that the ghost is in and relative proximity to the ghost location and you throw it down by hitting G, if the ghost tries to hunt you, it may slow that process down. So that can be very helpful. There we go. Okay, the EMF is going off. That's an example of EMF register. Ghost events and different ghost activity will register on this EMF. So there's an EMF 2. Now I'm going to bring a UV light. So now we have something called fingerprints. That's another ghost type of evidence. 
You notice there I'm using the UV light and a green fingerprint shows up. That is a fingerprints evidence. You would not see that there if the ghost did not have fingerprints as evidence. So it will put it on doors, potentially light switches. That's where it's gonna register, uh, also windows. That's where it's gonna register fingerprints. So now we have the other piece of evidence. We have fingerprints. So if you notice, now all the ghosts have been eliminated except a phantom. So in, based on our evidence, we've selected phantom is what we think our ghost is. Now what we're gonna do is try to make a little more money before we leave. So I have another video called Making Money on Phasmophobia. It's geared towards solo players, but you can do it in multiplayer. I'll link that up in the video. You can take a look there if you want. It's very helpful, kind of focuses you on the key items and helps you get in and out alive. Good video, hopefully you'll enjoy it. If we were to get hunted, if the ghosts were to become active and come after us, we're looking for places behind large standing furniture that break line of sight, which there are very few spots of that. We're also looking for lockers and closets. Those are gonna be your primary hiding spots for a ghost. In this case, this is an example of long, large standing furniture in the basement. Behind these boards, the ghost would not naturally see you. It could still get you, but this is an example of a hiding spot. Another example of a hiding spot would be a closet. In this map, there's a closet here in the hallway. Now notice, as you get up in difficulty, certain hiding spots will be full or unavailable. In this case, there's furniture and stuff <laughs> in the closet. You are not able to hide in here. That was a ghost event. That was a little shocking, a little scary. That ghost is getting less happy with us all the time. The other hiding option might be a locker. There's a few in the garage. So when the ghost hunts you, you wanna know where those hiding spots are and you wanna know if they're open and available. As you go through the house and you're trying to find things like the bone and your evidence, the ghost room, you wanna open those closets and check those. If you find one that's open, it's good to let your other party members know. And you can use global chat and say, the lockers in the garage are available or the closet in the hallway is available. You can do a number of those different things to help uh, save lives. Remember, your global push to talk, anybody can hear you, whether you're in the truck or in the house or anywhere. Your local push to talk is only going to be a proximity push to talk. It's only going to be audible to those that are in with reasonable proximity. Also note that if you are hunted, if, you, if the ghost does get active and starts to hunt you, the front door, whatever building you're in, will close and lock. Nobody will be able to enter or exit during the hunt. That's one indicator. You will hear it slam shut. The ghost hunt will go through a period of time, depending on your difficulty, and will end either when that time is elapsed or after somebody is killed. In a nightmare mode, it will continue on uh, either until the time has elapsed or everyone is dead. You can ultimately lose everybody in a single hunt. Typically on other difficulties though, only one person can die and the ghost will stop hunting you for a time. A little difference there too. That is how you know if a ghost is actually hunting you. When you're getting hunted, it's important to know that the sound you make and the equipment you have can alert the ghost to your location. So when you're trying to escape a hunt, when you're running to a locker or a closet or behind selected large furniture, you need to remember to turn off your flashlight and turn off any other equipment you may have, such as an EMF or, sound, or spirit box, anything that actually makes sound. Items like a microphone or a uh, thermometer, those items don't really matter. They're not gonna emit a sound, but your voice and certain equipment you're carrying and including your, your flashlight for visual can alert the ghost to your location if it's close by. Just know that as well. In addition to hiding, you need to make sure all your equipment is off to avoid getting killed. We're just about ready to go. There's a couple of objectives here we could do to try to, to get a little more money, but for the sake of this video, we're gonna move on. Notice my sanity has dropped from just being in the house and interacting with the ghost. It's now in the high 70s. So that means I'm getting closer to the ghost getting angry enough at me to hunt me, is what we're dealing with there. There is an item called a sanity pill. That's these items right here. If you were to select one of those, pick it up with your E, and you were to right click it, you'll notice my sanity will go up. Depending on your difficulty level, your sanity can increase by 50%, 25%, 
You can share those pills across other people to raise that average sanity. It essentially gives you some more time on the clock to help you identify the ghost and or get pictures or whatever you want to do. So it's a little bit of a buffer, a little protection there for you. Now, before we leave, we're going to look at a few more things. Photos. We've taken a number of photos. Most of them three stars. Most of them are going to contribute money to us, so that's a good thing. I could technically take three more photos um, and, and get a little more money, but again, for time, we're going to move on. The biggie is the evidence. We've identified three things, dots, spirit box, and fingerprints. We identified those three items showing up. So what we've done, again, by a process of elimination, is determine that we believe our ghost is a phantom. So we do have to select that ghost for it to count. We don't actually have to have selected the evidence for us to get the money at the end, but obviously you're going to go through and click and eliminate stuff as you go. So you might as well pick that. Selected Phantom. I've accomplished what I'm going to accomplish at this point. I could continue to go, but I'm not. We've taken the pictures we're going to take, and so we're ready to go. Again, I don't have to go get my equipment or anything like that. It will come back to me as long as I have not died in the game. So to leave, get everybody on board confirm that everybody has the ghost in their journal. Typically, I do a global push to talk so that if anybody's dead, they can hear me or anybody that's not quite to the truck can hear me. Make sure everybody has their journal filled out before you leave. If they have not picked the ghost in their journal, they will not get credit. All right, or left click the keypad and we're going to head out. We're almost done. Keep in mind, you can leave at any time. I could go to a ghost hunt and literally open the door and close the door and leave. I won't get anything for that. But you can do that. You can leave after taking a couple of pictures. You can do whatever you want. You know, that's the thing. You're solo. You pick it. Your group. The group ultimately has to get in the truck, but you can do whatever you want. So here is the contract payment or the reward screen. If you remember on our objective board, we had objectives one through four. In this case, objective one was identify the ghost. We had selected Phantom, and lo and behold, we were correct. So objective one, we got $10 for it. Objectives two and three had to do with getting hunted and getting a photo of the ghost. We did not do those. So we do not get those $10 times two. We could have done that, but we did not. Objective four was a ghost event. That was the ghost yelling at us or doing a number of those interactions. And so we got that objective by just being in the house around it. So that was good. Photos. This includes our bone. It includes our cursed possession item. It includes the footprints we got. Each of those adds dollars to the photo total. If we'd have gotten a picture of the ghost, that is your best picture. You want to try to get one of those if you can. Followed by the bone, cursed possessions, and then various fingerprints and footprints. Those are going to be your best options. There's also interactions you can take pictures of, running water in sinks and things like that. But anyway, there is a cap on photos. And, and ultimately you want to maximize the value of those photos. For instance, trying to get three stars, close proximity pictures, quality pictures, as well as the number of those and try to fill your book out. Don't die trying to get photos. It's not worth that, but you ultimately want to max that number if you can. Bone evidence. Remember I said the bones in every house, every building. We found that pretty quick. We got a photo of it. And so there's $10, easy peasy. Insurance. Insurance has to do with some of the easier difficulties. You can take pictures of a dead person after they after the ghost kills them. One of your party members can, and it actually provides you a little bit of return of money uh, in case. So when you die and you have to buy equipment back, it gives you a little money buffer so you're not completely zeroed. In this case, I didn't die. In this case, I can't take a picture of myself. So it's irrelevant. There is no money returned. All that money added up which is 30 plus 25, it's $55. Then you have a difficulty multiplier. This is where I tell you that, you know, don't be afraid to try higher difficulties. You actually get more money. In this case, we only had 55 bucks, but the difficulty multiplier bumped that dollar up in total. So we ended up with $165. Not bad. We didn't die. We didn't lose any equipment. We walked out of there with 165 bucks. Remember, if you all die in the ghost hunt, if everybody is killed by the ghost, if you all fail, you will not get those rewards. If at least one person makes it out of there, then even the dead people will make some money. You'll get a much reduced money amount, but you still will recover some dollars. Make sure even if you die that you fill out your journal and you, you make a ghost guess at least. 
and that if somebody is down to the last man standing, they don't take stupid chances that ultimately worst case, they make a guess and leave so that everybody can get a little money. Nobody completely loses out. So that's what I'll say about leaving and rewards. It's important to note that. Next screen gives you your level bump, a little bit of experience gain. You can see my levels. Here's some statistics if you're interested in those. Time and light, dark, ghost events, hunts, interactions. Those are all interesting things. Folks like to see that, how, many, how busy the ghost was, whatever. But some basic stats, interesting stuff. And then you're back. You're back to your server setup, your lobby setup, and you can rinse and repeat. So hopefully this has been helpful. You've done a great job. Follow this through. I know I've provided a lot more detail than you may need, but I'll put some timestamps in the video so you can kind of follow the pieces you're interested in. If you like the content, if you found it helpful, I would love for you to drop me a like and subscribe. That helps me grow my channel. It's very much appreciated. I will add that uh, equipment detail, how to use each piece of equipment and its pros and cons it will be part of the content at a later point. But for now, my name is Ben. This is Gen X Days, and thanks for coming.